Good morning. Good morning. So good to be here. Thank you for uh, letting me share the fellowship with you this morning and, and also share uh, God's word uh, with you. We are going to listen to Psalm 73. And before we go into the word, just let me pray. Lord, I thank you that uh, you have spoken, that you are not a, a silent God. Thank you for your word. And I pray that as we are going to open your word, that you will open up our lives for you. Let your li light shine into our lives. Amen. There are many different trends going on, and when I try to look at what kind of trends are going on in, uh, in America, one really sad tre trend, not the only, but one un uh, really sad trend is that a number of young Christians, young evangelicals, are really struggling with their faith. And Often the term deconstruction is used. If you Google it, you will see there's a lot of articles about evangelicals deconstructing their faith. What does that mean? It means people have been growing up in church, in a Christian family, they have a Christian faith, and then they are confronted with secular culture in a new way. Maybe when they are, uh, start to study at the university and doubts Try, uh, start to creep in, and they wondered, this faith that I have been brought up in, does it really hold water? Is it, is it really true? And a number are deconstructing their faith and leaving it altogether, or deconstructing it and making it into something that historically Christianity has never been. You know, in the Psalms, most of the Psalms, we do not, we are not given a context for why the Psalms was written. It's just a Psalm of praise for, to the glory of God or a, a Psalm of lament, something really difficult has happened, but we no, do not know the exact circumstances. But the Psalm we are going to study this morning, there we are given the context. It is the context of a person who is tempted to deconstruct his faith. A person where doubt has started to creep in. Is this really true? What I've be believed for so many years, should I continue to believe it? Or should I leave it? We are going to study a psalm of Asaph, a very interesting person. Uh, and in this psalm, Psalm 73, he gives us a kind of biography, not his whole life, but he are letting us in to a period in his life which was most dramatic, where everything he believed in was questioned. And he didn't know if his faith would survive. And it's so interesting to follow his biography where he's telling about his struggle and the way, uh, uh, the way that led him. Who was Asaph? Let's look into his CV first so we understand what kind of person he was. He was not anyone, anybody. He was the friend of King David. He was one of the closest co-workers of King David. He was one of the spiritual leaders in Israel. He was the worship leader in the temple. Or, uh, uh, more rightly, in, in the tabernacle. Because the temple was not yet built. In the, in the tabernacle. So he led the worship there. We can read about him in the historic books that he was a kind of charismatic, prophetic worship leader. He was led by the Holy Spirit, helping God's people to worship God. And he was a most gifted songwriter. He is the author be, uh, behind Psalm 50, and then all the Psalms between 73 and 83. 
and he has penned some really beautiful world, words. So he was so gifted. I hope you have this picture in, in your mind when we are going to study this psalm. This highly esteemed spiritual leader amongst God's people, close to King David, worshiping in the temple, week out and week in, helping uh, people to, to come close to God. And then something has happened. We're going to read the psalm in, uh, uh, in its different parts. So let's start with the first part, where he, where he describes the crisis that he found himself in. Surely, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From the callous hearts come iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouth lay claim to heaven, and their take, tongues take possession of the earth. This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? So, let's look at what's happened. Asaph made a discovery. God is good. That is my faith. Why then isn't he? Why then isn't he? The assumption for Asaph, and of course in, in all... Uh, 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 in all the faith, in, both in the Old and the New Testament, is that God is good. He's good to Israel. That is the focus of the worship. Praise the Lord. Why? Because He's good. He's a good God. But now doubt has come in. Asaph's experience goes against his faith he has started to look more honestly at reality. Is it true that God is good? Is it true that God is good to Israel? Is it true that there is a blessing to follow God? And he starts to look at different people's lives. And doubt comes in. I cannot see that God is good. Of course, he can see individual examples of someone believing in God and being blessed. Sure, and I'm sure he could see here's someone who is really ungodly and selfish, and he comes in a lot of trouble. Sure, there are those examples. But he can see other examples when someone is really trusting God and is a godly person, and suffering hits them. And then he looks at so many others that just ignore God, and they look like blessed. What's going on here? So Asaph starts to look really careful at the world. Look at the arrogant. They prosper and increase their wealth. Their bodies are healthy and strong, and their lives are easy. It looks like evil has no consequences. Look at that and that and look at those people. They do a lot of evil and they come away with it. Pride, violence, iniquity. It's just rampant. And God does not stop it. 
And worst of all, people, they dethrone God without any consequences. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. They mock God. And they say, how can God know? There is no God, or if there is a God, he doesn't care, he doesn't know. Nothing will happen if I just live for myself or just ignore God. And their words are becoming really popular. People are drawn to that kind of me message. Live for yourself, ignore God. He does not know, he does not care. Nothing will happen. And this becomes really painful for Asaph. His conclusion, it looks like, if I'm honest, if I'm just not uh, continue with the religious jargon and, and just repeat words I've heard before, if I'm really honest, it looks like all ancient wisdom is undermined. You know, trust in the Lord and he will make your path straight. I cannot see that. Pride g goes before destruction. No, does not always do that. If a man digs a pit, he will fall into it. No, not always. We do not reap what we saw. What we saw. That seems to be the conclusion when he looks around honestly in the world. I really like that Asaph is so honest that he raises all those questions. But this must have been a horrible time in his life. He was the worship leader in the tabernacle. So he was praising God because he's good, and in his mind and in his heart, there are just question marks. Is this true? And he must, he must have felt like a hypocrite being a worship leader and then entertaining all those thoughts himself. But I admire his honesty. There is no gain in lying to yourself. Let's look honest at the, the reality. Life is what it is. Truth is truth, whatever, <laughs> if I like it or not. So I think we need to have uh, Asaph's attitude of looking honestly at the world. Okay, let's uh, continue to read. Surely, in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I've been punished every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Now Asaph is letting us in to his inner struggle, and he seems to describe a kind of downward spiral in his, in his inner. The first is that he let us know that the starting point of this process was some kind of personal pain. He says, all day long I've been plagued, I've been punished every morning. So something has happened to him that is with him every new day when he wakes up. Maybe it was an illness that he became sick and the first thought every morning was the pain in his body. Could have been that. Could have been something else, we don't know. But something was, was stuck with him. It did not go away. I'm sure he has prayed, but it was still there. And this started his journey of doubt. It's interesting, here's an, <laughs> I think this illustrates how pathetic we human beings are. Couldn't you see the injustices in the world before you yourself were hit by it? Of course. <laughs> so he had no problem of, of singing, God is good when he was not suffering, but thousands of people around him were suffering. Then he didn't see the problem. But suddenly he, he, it hit home, and it becomes this huge problem because now I am suffering. A little bit pathetic, isn't it? But the question is still true. 
Why is there injustices in the world? And his pain has awakened him to the horror of that question. How can there be a God when the world is like this? And he struggles with this. And he says, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. He couldn't stand any longer. That was the feeling. His face was just crashing down. And he nearly gave up it and left. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. There is no point in following the Lord. That was the temptation, the doubt that he had in his heart. The result? He started to envy the wicked, the godless. He was grieved and embittered. Why have I served the Lord when I could have lived for myself? Horrible. <laughs> Horrible feeling. Looking back at your life and being bittered of why he had chosen to, to serve the Lord. And he pondered, should I shift side? Maybe I should leave the faith. And one of the things he, that holds him back is that he is a leader. And if he shifts side, he will draw so many other people with him. So he needs to be really sure before he takes that step. But he has the, the thought in his mind, should I, should I join the other side? And he says, he tried to see through the problem, but he couldn't. It seemed like an unsolvable problem to him. When I read the psalm so far, I think it's really up to date. Because what we see here is that Asaph had become, became a humanist. All through the psalm so far, he has himself as the ultimate point of reference. Everything is out from his personal life. He tries to understand everything out from his individual situation in the present. And that become, becomes the, the, the key to interpret reality. And this is, of course, uh, if I speak about secular Europe, this is the main perspective of people today. They are humanists trying to understand life just out from their own immediate experience. Thank God the Psalms does not end here. <laughs> it continues. So... Asaph is letting us in to what happened in this, in this darkness, in this doubt, in this temptation to deconstruct his faith. Something happened. This situation lasted until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you have placed them on a slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet, I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Some of the most beautiful words in the whole book of the Psalms, of the new joy and the new vision and the new presence of God in the life of Asaph. What was the victory of Asaph? Well, he tells us. He came to the sanctuary. Was it, 
was that during a public worship time or during one of the times of offerings, we don't know. Or was it that he searched for the face of God himself early in the morning or late at night, being all alone, wrestling with those issues and searching for God? He does not tell us. He came to the sanctuary. And when he was there, something happened. He started to doubt his own doubts. He started to doubt his own doubts and started to see from another perspective. I think this is really an important uh, part of dealing with doubt and the temptation of deconstruction. We need to do a lot of hard thinking, but we need also to, um, to search for God. Not only think, but also be open to experience God. And when he is in the temple or in the, in the tabernacle, uh, he gradually starts to see things from God's perspective, not only from his own. And what is the bigger perspective? The bigger perspective is that there is a coming judgment. God really cares about the injustices in the world, and there will come a day when everything will be put right again. And Asaph's mistake was to judge God in the midst of history, not at the end of history. You know, I come from Sweden, and ice hockey is a, is a big thing in, in Sweden. And our team is usually one of the, the top teams in, in, in the world, world uh, championships. And we often compete with Finland, our neighbors. So that's really important, uh, important game, Sweden and Finland in ice hockey. And a number of years ago, uh, it was world championship. It was, if I remember right, the final. And uh, after two periods, Finland led the match with 5-0. Absolutely horrible. And the majority of the Swedish population just turned, turned off their television. We've lost. Of course we've lost. What a bad team. Why can't they deliver when it really matters? What's going on? And so disappointed on the team. In the third period, Everything's changed, and Sweden won by 6-5. And of course, that is a really important illustration. You cannot judge a team in the midst of the match. You have to wait until the match is over before you condemn them as really losers. <laughs> and this is what Asaph did. He judged God in the midst of history before the match is over. But in the sanctuary, he suddenly saw the big perspective. God is going to judge all injustices. Let us divert for, for a, a short time here. Let's look on a principle level. How can you, how can you think about justice? the problem that Asaph had. There's some, so much injustices. So you have one alternative is to say what the secular perspective tells us. Basically, there will be no justice. There's no justice now, and there will never be any justice because there's no God. History will end in nothing. Evil people will come away with all their evil. Oppressed people will be oppressed, and there will, they will never have justice because there is no God. There is no moral justice, there's no moral norm. There is no justice. Face it. Horrible perspective. Another perspective, which we find in the Eastern religions, is to say, no, life is actually just as it is now. Because the law of karma 
automatically adjust reality so justice is done. So if you're living a good life, it's because of you've been such a good person in your previous existence. If you're suffering, that's exactly what you should have. Because you were such an evil person in your previous existence. So everything is as it should be at every moment. A number of years ago, I, uh, I was going down from Stockholm, where I lived, down to uh, Lund, a university town in the south. Uh, and I was waiting uh, for the train. And the train was delayed. And it was delayed. And it was delayed. And it was actually delayed to such a degree that even Swedes started to talk with each other on the platform. <laughs> so you realize it was really delayed. Uh, and, and a young woman stood uh, close by, and she started to talk to me and said, oh, so where are you going? And uh, I'm going down to learn. Oh, well, well, uh, what are you going to do there? Oh, I'm, I, I, I will actually give a, a presentation on Christianity, the uniqueness of Christ, and world religions. Uh, I said, oh, so interesting. I'm, I'm very interested in spiritual things, she said. So we started to talk about that, and I found out that she was drawn into the New Age movement, and she actually belonged to like a cell group, a home group, uh, of a very well-known New Age personality in Sweden, uh, Ralf Lundsten, a well-known composer who composes kind of New Age music, this kind of wavy, soft uh, uh, music. So we, we, we talked about that, and I, I asked her, so, uh, uh, why are you, uh, uh, why are you so drawn to uh, new age thinking? Well, what is the attra attractive thinking there? And she immediately said, "The law of karma, because it solves the problem of evil." And in, in a sense, it does. It gives an answer to the problem of evil. So all evil happens because evil in a previous existence. So it's a kind of answer. But in my view, it's the most horrible answer any humans have ever come up with. Because you're accusing people for their suffering, that it is caused by something in a previous life that no one knows anything about. So it's, it's a horrible, uh, evil doctrine. I then asked her and said, in, in my family, since I was a, uh, a child, we have had a, a close friend. And uh, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, hit by a, a, a big thing in, in, uh, when he was a child, four years old, and he's been in, in a wheelchair since, since then. So, of course, he has, he has suffered a lot. So, would you say to him it was his own fault because he had been evil in his previous life? <laughs> so then she became really uncomfortable and say, no, 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 of course I wouldn't say that. But that is what I think. The third view is the biblical view. There is a coming justice. Life now is unjust, but there is a future justice when everything will be put right, and God will be shown to be almighty, to be good, and to be righteous a just judge of everything that has happened within history. And that is what Asaph realized in the sanctuary. There is a coming judgment. And then he, he gives us two really interesting pictures. He looks at the ungodly, those who reject God, and says, well, actually, their ex existence is like, like a dream with God. You know when you have a dream... It's really real when you're in the dream and then you wake up and phew, the dream just disappears. The ungodly, they are like a dream to God. And one day they will just disappear. They will just go away. Horrible picture of human existence to be like a, a nightmare to God. And that the nightmare then just disappears. And then he views at himself and says, and I, in my doubts, I were like an animal. I was like a brute beast. I did not understand. 
but now God has lifted him out from his, his doubt. And the third thing, so he came to the sanctuary to search for God. He saw God's perspective, the bigger picture. He was not a humanist any longer. And thirdly, and the, the most important, he was drawn into the presence of God. He was given a totally new focus for his life. And now you're here. It's not Asaph in the center. It's God at the center of his life. I'm always with you. You hold me. You guide me. You will take me into glory. Earth has nothing I desire besides you. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So he has the presence of God in his life. He has a new center in his life. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all of your deeds. A lot of young people, when they struggle with issues of faith, I think they, they are making a mistake, and it's the, our culture that forces them to, or forces us, if, if we are in doubt today, forces us to, to do that mistake. And that is that we think that in order to rely on God, I need to make, take a step of faith, a leap of faith. The alternative is that I just rely on science and reason and my senses. So people picture for themselves, you have the faith there, and then you have science and reasons and facts and uh, and your own senses. And that is just the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the road ahead. And the alternative is to take a, a, a step of faith to rely on God. But that is not the true picture. The true picture is that you are like at a dead end street. On one side, you can take a step of faith, a leap of faith saying there is no God. There is no justice. There is no meaning. There is no hope. There is no God. But that is a leap of faith. And then you have the other alternative. There is a God. There is real justice. There is meaning. There is hope. There is grace. And sure, that is a step of faith. But both alternatives, they are a step of faith. When I, when I listen to people who have deconstructed their faith, they very often present it as, 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 now I'm following science and reasons and facts, and they don't see that they, they have just taken another step of faith to the other side, which is a really gloomy side, where there is nothing important actually left for human existence. It's, it's a really dark picture. Asaph's questions. We should notice that in the psalm, at least, there is no answer to a specific question, and he does not say that his pain was lifted away from him. So his struggle were not solved by the specific issue of his pain being fully answered by God, but he was given two other answers that made it possible for him to continue to believe and enjoy God, even though his pain might have still been there, there was an answer on the level of principles, namely, justice is coming, God's judgment. And there was a personal, existential answer, God's presence with him. He experienced God's goodness to him. Like C.S. Lewis says in his famous word, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. For some time, it was like the pain in Asaph's life, life were leading him away from God, but actually, in the end, because he searched for God, his pain, in the end, drew him closer to God. Notice a very important thing. 
in our individualistic culture, the meaning of life is very often defined as lack of pain and personal enjoyment. That's kind of what we think about what is the meaning of life. But in, in the, according to the Christian faith, the meaning of li life is not lack of pain, but communion with God. And that is not limited to what is now, but that is the eternal perspective. Communion with God, that is the meaning of life. Of course, that is not in contrast to joy, beauty, and pleasure, because God is the source of joy, beauty, and pleasure. But they are ultimately found in Him, in Him, uh, Him alone. In Galatians, Galatians, Paul's letter to Galatians, we find an interesting thing. I said that Asaph, during his struggle, started to doubt if we really will reap what we saw. In Galatians 6, verse 7, 7 to 10, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The, the one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So you see, the principle of sowing and reaping is there, but it's not an immediate, in the proper time, and ultimately at the return of the Lord. Uh, at the end of history. So how did Asaph's life end? He has drawn us into this troublesome time, uh, period in his life when he was doubting God and struggling with God and he had all those issues and he has told us how he came out of it and how he started to enjoy God and honestly again could worship God. Did he later on fall back into his doubt and left the faith? Interestingly enough, we can actually answer that question. Because in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, we meet the old Asaph. And there it's no longer the tabernacle, it's actually the temple. And Asaph is there worshiping God. And what is he singing? The text tells us he is good. His love endures forever. So that became the dominant theme for the rest of his life. God is good. His love endures forever. So what kind of song are your heart singing? What kind of songs are coming from your lips? This morning we are challenged by the words of, of Asaph. He's been honest about his doubts, his struggles, but he has also shown us a way to victory, a victory that comes from God. And he continues to sing, God is good. His love endures forever. Thank you, Lord, that you want to draw us into your presence. We thank you for your good hand in our lives. And I pray if when we are doubting and struggling, that you will come to us and draw us into your presence and let your life, light shine upon our darkness. Amen.